Now, without any further delay, let's begin today's business call to action webinar, Women's Economic Empowerment, the Inclusive Business Case. I would like to introduce your moderator for today, Paula, Head of Business Call to Action. Paula, you have the floor. Thank you, Jessica, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're thrilled that you've joined us today. So as Jessica mentioned, today's webinar is Women's Economic Empowerment, the Inclusive Business Case. This is the first webinar of a series of three webinars uh, that are looking at the intersection between women's economic empowerment and inclusive business. The other two webinars, uh, just so you know, will be held on the next two Tuesdays. February 6th and February 13th, respectively. Uh, they will be looking at enablers and constraints and uh, measuring impact around economic empowerment as well, women's economic empowerment as well. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't done so, please do register. So before I introduce the topic of today and our speakers, <clears throat> I'll uh, give you a bit of a, a reminder of the structure that we'll have. We, are going to have 40 minutes of discussion with our speakers, and then we're going to open up for 20 minutes of Q&A with all of you. Uh, during the discussion, as Jessica mentioned, you will be on listen-only mode. Uh, please send your questions, and if you want to direct your question to a specific panelist, please say so on your question, so that would help me as a moderator <clears throat> to guide that uh, to our speakers. Um, so on to today's topic. Uh, we are starting this year with, uh, with a topic that I think is very important for us and it's at the center of inclusive business. Uh, Sustainable Development Goal 5 calls specifically for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls and this is central to the achievement of all the 17 SDGs. Without that, the SDGs are simply not going to happen. Um, since our inception in 2008, we've been working very closely with companies um, to make sure that they are inclusive of all segments of society, including women, uh, in a way that uh, they are able to participate and benefit from the economy. Uh, we have more than 200 members at BCTA, and many of our companies are championing the empowerment of women at the base of the economic pyramid. So today uh, we have Afripat, who will be speaking uh, as one of our member companies, and in the rest of the series we also have uh, four more companies who will be sharing without their experience and knowledge. Um, but these are just illustrative of the many, many uh, good work that uh, several BCTA companies are doing. Um, women are critical to the global economy, but uh, sadly they do remain excluded and the dynamics that we're seeing in the world sadly are reversing some advances as well. Uh, according to a report by McKinsey Global Institute, closing the gap, the gender gap in employment alone could add 20 trillion to the global GDP by 2025. And studies also show that actively promoting gender equality and women's empowerment enhance the economic benefits to a company, but they also help reduce the gender inequalities in the communities in which these businesses operate. So obviously this creates a virtuous cycle uh, that helps both companies and communities to get. So this webinar wants to examine precisely that. What is that business case and what is that role that inclusive business can play in empowering women economically, uh, be it through the appropriate goods and services that they offer or through job creation and income generation opportunities. Uh, we're going to try to respond to questions such as what is the business case for investing in women's economic empowerment? How can some inclusive business models be uh, how have uh, inclusive business models been successful at doing this, and how can companies further promote inclusive business practices that empower women? We know that many of you out there are doing it, but we also recognize that more can be done, uh, and we always have to raise our ambition when it comes to uh, reaching for gender equality. Um, I would like to give a very warm welcome to our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, joining us today, we have Aditi Mohapatra. She is a director at BSR and she leads the work on women's empowerment. Uh, BSR, for those that may not know it, uh, it's a global nonprofit organization uh, and it uh, supports more than 250 companies and other partners around the world to build a just and sustainable world. We are also joined by Anna Falt. She's the Global Program Manager of Empower Women. This is an initiative uh, which is facilitated by UN Women and it's dedicated to empower women to achieve their full economic potential 
and inspiring both men and women to become advocates and change makers in, and leaders in their community. And finally, we have Katie Lindquist. She's a communications executive at AfriPath. As I mentioned, AfriPath is a BCTA member company and is an incredible social enterprise that specializes in manufacturing locally um, a cost-effective and reusable sanitary pad uh, for women in Uganda, women and girls in Uganda. <clears throat> so we're now going to hear from our speakers. I would like to ask, ask our speakers to take five or six minutes to briefly introduce your organization and the work that you're doing, uh, but also share your initial thoughts around the central question of the business case of investing in women's empowerment. Um, Aditi, if we could start with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me on this webinar today. Um, so at BSR, you know, we're thinking about the topic of women's empowerment from, from a many different dimensions, and in particular, really looking at the opportunities for business to lead here. How can business truly move the needle in a space where we know, and we just heard from Paula, we, we really haven't seen the kind of progress that we would want to see. We know that the business and societal benefits of promoting women are clear, yet we know that women really remain far from equal in many aspects of work. They earn less, they own less, and they have more limited access to essential products and services. So what we want to do, what I want to do with today's webinar, the opening bit here, is really to look at what some of the opportunities look like for, for business. At BSR, we really look at how women intersect with business across the full value chain. We look at how women are part of the producers as business owners, executives, employees, distributors, and consumers, and we encourage our members and those companies that we work with to really take this kind of holistic approach to women's empowerment. We know that with globalization, value chains really have unlocked many different opportunities for women to participate more fully in the labor market and access new products and services which really, truly can improve their well-being. What we're seeing is that companies that are really narrowly focused on actions and impacts within just their four walls, what they're doing within their own employees, are really having a limited focus and are not truly unlocking the potential that we see as possible with a more deliberate value chain approach to women's empowerment. Today, what we think is that companies have both a responsibility and an incentive to address social and environmental issues across their full value chains and align their corporate values with a sense of mission and purpose. We, we see that empowering women in the value chain presents an incredible opportunity not only to improve the lives of women who are making and selling and buying products, but actually to really improve businesses as well, to ensure that you have more stable and efficient supply chains, to be able to draw on a diverse pool of talent, and to reach new customer segments, all of which can impact and improve both short-term and long-term financial performance. We're going to get into some of the more specifics about business benefits here on the next slide. So here what we see is that there's three main areas where we see business benefits. One is in market growth, and as Paula mentioned in the opening, we heard from McKinsey that closing the gender gap could increase the global economy, the GDP of the global economy rates by $28 trillion. We know that there are many elements of cost savings and productivity if women had equal access to agricultural resources, for example. Agricultural output in developing countries would increase by an average of 4% and would have the, the add-on effect of reducing the number of undernourished people by as much as 17%. And we know that investing in women also drives innovation and new, new product and service development. We know um, that really when you're looking at market growth in particular, you should be looking at increasing access to goods and services for women across all ends of the income spectrum. Women we today create and control an increasing share of wealth in many parts of the world, which really makes them a very important consumer demographic to pay close attention to. We also know that companies that really engage women in the design, development, and sale of products so that the services that, and products that they're designing are by women and for women have an increasingly important ability to take advantage of this growing market. In cost savings and productivity, there's a number of examples where engaging women effectively 
can really lead to increases in productivity and reduce absenteeism. For example, at BSR, we run a program investing in women workers in global supply chains, in, in training women workers in global supply chains in sexual and reproductive health. And we know that those investments really do lead to reductions in violence and reduced absenteeism for women. And then in innovation, we know that when women can speak freely and openly, they're able to bring forward new ideas and contribute to problem solving. With many industries around the world facing talent shortages, addressing the needs and barriers facing women will be a key differentiator, we believe. So we know that this is important, but we also know that it's challenging to do. Part of what we do is work with our members to develop a women's empowerment strategy. There are three key principles that we, we ask companies to keep in mind when, when they're taking this approach. One is that they think in a holistic manner. This means thinking about women's empowerment within the broader social, political, and cultural context. Not thinking about it as a siloed effort, but really un under addressing the underlying systemic barriers that women face to really have an impact. This also means thinking about things in an integrated manner, which means taking into account a company's full value chain and embedding gender throughout your operations. So again, thinking about gender in a horizontal manner and not as a siloed individual function within a company. And then, of course, in a, in a strategic way, which means prioritizing and putting resources effectively based on where your competitive advantage might be. I'm going to quickly take you through a four-step process that we have found has been an effective way to get companies to do this within, within your own strategies and your own workplaces. So first is to establish the business case. So as we talked earlier, we talked a bit about what the business case is broadly uh, for investing in women's empowerment. But really, the first step here should be understanding why for your own business investing in women is critically important and developing a customized business case for, for yourself. This means thinking about where you have the biggest impact on women. For some companies, that very obviously may be within your own workforce, but for others, that very well may be within distribution or within the marketing and, and uh, advertising of your products. So really understanding your own unique business case is in particular very important to start the conversation. Next is setting the priorities. Once you understand why women's empowerment is important for your business, you can identify how and, and where you should invest. So again, this should really include a broad and holistic analysis of the factors contributing to women's advancement. Thinking about issues like gender-based violence, thinking about sexual and reproductive health, and thinking about many of the underlying systemic factors that, that, that really do, do challenge women's ability to participate fully in the formal economy. Here what we've done is had an illustrative map where you could map out issues on a two by two matrix of how important they are to women's empowerment on one axis and then on the other on as to how important they are to your company. By doing this kind of analysis, you can identify issues of particular importance both to your company's success as well as to being able to drive women's advancement. Step three, is to identify, of course, the opportunities for action. Here, what's really important is that you think creatively about the ways in which you can influence women's empowerment. This, of course, again, means investing in thinking about your own employees, but it also means thinking very intentionally about your purchasing power and how you are sourcing from or not sourcing from women-owned businesses. This also, think, this also means thinking about the role that you have in advocacy and addressing uh, many laws in countries where women are unable to participate in, in uh, the economy and thinking about how your branding and, and marketing efforts also either reinforce ge negative gender stereotypes or could be used to challenge gender stereotypes. And then in the last step, it's really about integrating and implementing this within your own workforce, within your own company. You need to think through how to build the right structures, incentives, and cultures to really ensure that there's action. For this, we think that there are three main areas, measurement, governance, and culture. In governance, it's really important to think about creating a cross-functional team. 
again, making sure that, that women's empowerment is not siloed and just owned by diversity or HR within a company, but thinking about how each of your different functions within a company can really be used to, to advance women's empowerment. Creating that cross-functional team will ensure that you're able to bring the best of, of each of the different aspects of your company. Establishing goals, make sure that you all have that common vision and that you're working in the same direction, and it also helps to ensure oversight and accountability. Um, we'll get into some more of this in, in the Q&A section. So for now, I'm going to uh, pause here and I'm going to pass it over to our next panelist. Thank you, Aditi. And Anna, could I ask you to do the same? Take five uh, or six, six minutes, sorry, to walk us through the important work that Empower Women is doing and, um, and, and, and around the issue of the business case and the work with the private sector. Thank you so much. Um, I assume I'm unmuted? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for um, giving me the space to talk about UN Women's work and women's economic empowerment. And um, we have had a, a very exciting year um, in 2017 where we have tried to pull all of our resources and efforts together under one umbrella and that includes the women's empowerment principles um, that I will talk a little bit more about today. Um, and the Empower Women community has allowed us to um, put this ecosystem together with um, women uh, from all over the world, together with organizations um, um, that work on women's economic empowerment along with uh, companies. And I'd like to start first with some of the CEOs that we've been uh, working with since the inception of the Women's Empowerment Principles in 2010. And they have really laid out the, the business case. And I think it's important to, to indicate that um, the business case is becoming more and more clear to everyone. Um, there has been a lot of research, and, and the previous speaker was um, laying out a number of uh, statistics that we've seen emerging, and the business case is becoming more and more clear. Here's Pax World um, that is really um, indicating that business need to be the key drivers in advancing gender equality and women's empowerment, and that they believe is there. Um, the next step is really how do we implement it. And they, uh, the president is emphasizing that gender equality is not only a moral imperative, but a strategic business and investment imperative, as we heard also from the previous speaker. Uh, we also have a few words um, about fostering innovation and strengthening our uh, business. So I'm going to... Um, um, run quickly to this slide where we have seen, and it's very similar to uh, BSR's approach of looking at economic growth, innovation, and performance of the three pillars uh, for the business case, and we can see very clearly. I'm not going to uh, repeat um, similar data, um, but I just want to emphasize that women's empowerment and corporate sustainability is very closely uh, linked together. Um, we heard from both uh, the workplace, the marketplace, and the community, and that is what the women's empowerment principles are about. It really requires the top high-level corporate leadership for gender equality. This includes, uh, to sign on to the web, uh, you need to have a CEO um, at in really uh, endorsing the, the agenda. But more importantly, um, to also have the executive team, to have uh, the board um, really uh, understanding the business case, and then to communicate this to the whole organization and the company. And sometimes we see that the largest hurdles is actually at the mid-level management uh, level, where uh, they are the ones recruiting and doing the actual work day to day, and that's the, the biggest hurdle. I think we have come to the point um, today where we can say that many CEOs are ready to stand up for, for gender equality. And we can see that also with the growth of companies. Today we have over 1,700 
uh, companies that have committed to this agenda. Looking at uh, the principles two, three, and four, uh, they address the workplace issues, uh, treat all women and men fairly at work, respect and support human rights and non-discrimination. This is all about recruitment, uh, retention, uh, promotion, and leadership of women in the workplace. Uh, number three is around uh, ensuring health, safety, and well-being of uh, all women and men workers. This also includes what is very, a very hot topic today around uh, sexual harassment in, in the workplace. And uh, promote education, training, and professional development for women in, in the workplace. And that also brings me to um, number five, which is also working with uh, women entrepreneurs in the supply chain and also offering them support and training to engage in a company's supply chain. And we have um, last year initiated a campaign called Unstereotype Alliance, uh, where we are really looking at advertisement and marketing and see how we can uh, eliminate biases and stereotypes uh, in the broader uh, marketing practices um, of companies. Uh, equally important, and I think we have a few speakers talking about the community initiative and advocacy, is where a company is based uh, that they also take responsibility for the women and the practices that they have in, in the community itself. <laughs> this year, we have uh, just initiated a project uh, in G7 countries uh, where we will work very closely to um, focus on number seven of the women's empowerment principles, which focuses on the measurement and publicly reporting and transparency of the progress. That we know and we've heard from many companies that once they have made a public statement of their intentions to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, that is also the time when they, they need to start measuring for their stakeholders and um, for their um, employees as well. Everybody, once it's out in the public, uh, they start reporting and of course they will also um, collect the data that is required to do so. So we will focus very much on 2018 on, on uh, principle seven. Uh, we see that as a key and critical um, activity. Um, also what we're going to focus on this year is around the supply chain. And we heard, heard uh, Aditi earlier talking about the importance of looking throughout the whole supply chain. And what we are going to work closely with a few companies is on gender responsive procurement. To really go into the nitty gritty of understanding how uh, you can better source from women entrepreneurs and women owned business and what that does actually mean. Sometimes it can be very simple steps um, that a company can tweak its policies or practices and immediately will have an impact and effect on um, women entrepreneurs in the community. Uh, and it goes from establishing a corporate policy, uh, which is the more um, ambitious agenda, uh, but uh, focusing on how to source from women entrepreneurs doesn't have to have this um, eight-step approach, but could uh, go in and, and focus a little bit more on, on tweaking some of the existing uh, efforts that are being done to source uh, from suppliers. Um, I would also like to um, talk a little bit about the Web Gap Analysis Tool. Uh, we launched this tool in March last year, and it's a self-assessment tool uh, against the seven principles that I just talked about. Um, and it's really to uh, uh, make companies aware of where they stand in the implementation of the Women's Empowerment Principle. Where do they stand against the other companies in their own industry, in their own sector? Um, so it's a complete confidential um, information. It's not being disclosed, even though we would, in 2018, encourage companies to um, actually um, showcase their, their results, as I um, talked about earlier. Um, 
But what we have seen that once the companies start uh, taking this um, or answering to the questions uh, in this self-assessment, uh, it gives them ideas for how to develop their own action plan. Um, so it is a tool to both understand what can be done, but also um, to see where they stand in the range of different companies, um, globally, uh, regionally, and sectorally. So I would like to end at that, and, and I look forward to continue the conversation uh, throughout this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. This uh, this is great. Uh, and Katie, can I ask you to go next, please? Yes, thank you so much um, for everyone tuning in today, and thank you, Aditi and Anna, for laying a really strong foundation for the business case for women's empowerment. I'm hoping I can uh, provide a real-life example of a company that's not only producing a product that helps women to participate more meaningfully in the workforce, but also a company that's been able to integrate women into every single part of the value chain. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit more about why we started Africaz and then provide more information on our business model. So Africaz was founded in 2009 in rural Uganda in response to the gap in the consumer market between costly disposable sanitary pads and the crude, unhygienic alternatives that women and girls often rely on. The reality is that millions of women and girls across not only Sub-Saharan Africa but across the world uh, face huge challenges when their periods come every month. Um, some studies show that one out of 10 girls in Sub-Saharan Africa misses school because of her period, leading to high school dropout rates, early child marriage, and teenage pregnancy. Um, and many women who lack access to affordable sanitary materials are forced to miss out on productive days of work. Um, which holds them back from financial security and career growth. And without access to any type of formal sanitary materials, many women and girls are forced to rely on alternatives like rags or leaves that not only leave them feeling uncomfortable and insecure while on their period, but also put them at risk for infections and other health complications. So Afropaz was founded in response to these challenges um, with the goal of really supporting women and girls to thrive every single day of the year. We've created um, a very simple but very innovative reusable sanitary pad um, that is made um, locally in Uganda and is designed to provide women and girls with protection for at least one year at one-third the cost of disposable sanitary pads. We've used a sort of community-driven design approach where we talk to women across Uganda and across Africa um, to hear what they need in a sanitary pad product so to make sure that we're providing a product that not only is affordable, but, but that women really want to use. To do this, uh, we've developed um, an interesting model that not only um, provides a powerful product that keeps women in school, that keeps women at work, but also supports many women in rural Uganda with jobs that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have. So we currently have a two-brand model. Our oldest brand, the brand that we started with in 2009, the Afropads brand, um, is sold to NGOs and relief markets who buy the product in bulk and distribute to beneficiaries in low-income settings and refugee settings. Um, but what we started to see a couple years ago is that there's huge demand by women and girls living across the continent who maybe aren't um, beneficiaries of an NGO or living in more low-income settings for the product. And so in 2015, we launched our own retail brand called SoSure um, that right now is launched all across Uganda. So any woman or girl living in even some of the most remote areas of Uganda can walk to a small shop and find SoSure and buy it for themselves. So this is a product that's really marketed to retail and end users. Both the Afropods and the sister brand utilize very different pricing and marketing strategies. Um, but through both, we've been able to reach over 2 million women and girls across more than 30 countries. So this is a product that is not only changing the lives of the women and girls who are making it and using it in Uganda, but is reaching women as far as Yemen and Afghanistan, um, all the way to South Africa and even parts of Latin America. 
As a social business, we not only make and sell a product that has an immense impact on women's lives, uh, but we also model inclusive business practices as a company. Women are at every single part of our value chain, from production to selling. Um, we decided to base our production facilities in rural Uganda, um, outside of a town called Masaka, where we currently employ more than 150 women, most of whom who have never participated in the formal economy before. We not only provide these women with a steady salary, but also provide important benefits, including health insurance. And each woman you talk to at our production facilities will have a different story about how their job at, at Afropads transformed the way they're able to participate in the economy and the types of opportunities that is opened up for their families. We really believe that part of what sets us apart from our competitors who have actually grown quite significantly in the last five years is that we have um, a commitment to women and girls in Uganda and have integrated social business practices is as part of our model. And this is one of the driving reasons why we sort of are continuing to invest in production in Uganda. We're in the process of building a brand new 2,700 square meter factory in rural Uganda, which will provide hundreds of more jobs to women in rural Uganda who aren't currently a part of the formal workforce. Lastly, um, we believe that pads are not a silver bullet. Um, keeping girls in school, enabling women to participate more meaningfully in the workforce takes a much more holistic solution. And we can provide all of our partners with as much information and tools as they can to do what they do best. So in the last few years, we've designed sort of a suite of education and data tools for our partners to use free of cost to further amplify their work, including curriculum on menstrual hygiene management, um, data collection tools so NGOs and relief organizations can further prove their impact and show why providing girls with a reusable and long-lasting solution to menstrual sanitation um, is improving their, their uh, participation in the workforce and their education attendance. And we really believe that we are not just a company, but we are a partner. Um, not only to the people we sell our product to, but also to the women we are investing in around the world. So I'll stop there for now. Um, I hope that this gives you a better example of how we can make the, the case for an inclusive business practice um, and how women can be a part of every single part of the value chain in a company. Um, all right, I'll hand it back over to Paula. Thank you, Katie. It is um, it is an example that I really love. I think uh, Afripath is, uh, as uh, Aditi and Anna emphasize, you know, look all throughout the value chain, and, and it is definitely what Afripath is doing. So I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions, and uh, I encourage the audience to start thinking about your questions. We'll do uh, one round or so uh, from me, but then I'll open it up for you to, to submit your questions via the Q&A. So I'll start with Anna. Um, <clears throat> Anna, Empower Woman has um, obviously done a great job in its, uh, since its creation and it's sharing a lot of evidence and experiences and good practices. And we just heard from you about this uh, gap analysis tool, which I also find fascinating. Uh, but you also mentioned that sometimes um, the issue of mindsets is difficult and uh, you specifically called out on middle management. It'd be great to hear from you, <coughs> apologies, what can be done differently? Uh, what can we do differently as development actors, the public sector, others, in order to, to go about changing that mindset? Thank you so much. Um, it is a very, very challenging uh, exercise, uh, for sure. And, um, but I think it, looking at um, how to change mindset, I think it's um, first of all, um, of course, to to make sure that everyone is aware of the business case. Um, but the most challenging is really to change the way that people work. They are so used to uh, their habits and the way of working, and they really need to feel that they have something um, that drives them, incentives to, to make those changes in the way that they work and the way that they think. We talk often about unconscious bias, but even more importantly is to address the conscious bias. There's a lot of conscious bias, um, and it, it links to the way that we do day-to-day um, -day work and, and how we are doing that. 
And I think I'll go in a little bit later on, on how we can um, create uh, a new uh, business model. Um, but I would just like to emphasize that um, what we are going to do on our side, um, having been uh, discussing the business case for many years, we think we need to move on and really help uh, to develop the how-tos. So, for example, if you're doing, uh, you're advertising a position, there's a lot of biases already in an advertisement for a position and a job description to the way that we are selecting candidates to uh, the way we are conducting um, interviews for those candidates. So just looking at a very narrow uh, exercise of recruitment into companies, for example. And uh, what we are going to focus on, on this year uh, is really to get to those nitty-gritty uh, tools and resources for uh, middle management to really understand how they can change the way that they work. Um, and uh, even they can be the, the most committed people but don't really understand that tweak in, in the way that we uh, operate and that we are uh, conducting our, our business. And not to say that it's only in the private sector that we need to do this, but across the board, um, there are lots of, of people also in, in development and in, in the public sector that are facing similar challenges. And we hope that with the work that we will be doing um, uh, from our side in UN Women um, in New York, we will be having a project in G7 uh, countries where we are going to work with companies in the, these, but we'll also have projects in Latin America and Asia um, to uh, really start from the larger companies and hopefully through their supply chains also reach out to, to the rest of the, the world through, through the companies and their commitments to the women's empowerment principles um, touching the workplace, marketplace, and, and the community. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. Um, Aditi, a question for you. So you mentioned, of course, the importance of not doing isolated initiatives, aiming for meaningful change. Um, perhaps can you provide us with one or two concrete company examples that you think are doing a good job at addressing women's economic empowerment? Sure. So I think, you know, some of it is, is challenging to say, you know, what a good job looks like and, and whether or not we're necessarily making meaningful progress here. I think there's some broad indicators that show uh, things might be moving in the right direction and yet, you know, um, not enough research has necessarily been done on the impact of different interventions um, in their entirety to have a very good sense of, of you know, what collectively all of this, all of these corporate dollars that are going into this space, what the impact has really been. I do think, though, on an individual programmatic basis, there are examples that we can point to where we know things have worked. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's some things that are both kind of direct, what companies have done uh, for their own workforces and their own uh, supply chains. And then, of course, there's more of the indirect kind of um, issues that they've tried to address. So on the direct side, you know, we've worked with um, a, a Swedish fashion company, Kapal, who sources from Bangladesh, for example, where we know that there are a number of societal challenges facing women in particular. Um, and, you know, they've worked to develop and open a training center to provide economic opportunities for women in the community. That training center provides basic education, reading, writing, arithmetic, and then, of course, skills like sewing. Um, as part of that, they also gain access to knowledge, uh, excuse me, access to knowledge on health and nutrition and um, medical treatment. So many, the program we know has trained to date close to 1,000 companies, or excuse me, 1,000 women who have gone on to work in factories. Many of them are definitely gaining the ability to work um, in the formal economy for the first time and in a sense of independence. We also know that one of the keys to the program's success was the engagement of family members and communities in that process. So many of the fathers or husbands in the situation did not want of course, female household members to work outside of the home, um, that obviously stemming from cultural norms as well as fears around safety to traveling to the training center, um, also fears of safety just in working in the garment factory given the Rana Plaza um, 
factory collapse uh, in 2013 as well. And so to address that, there is, of course, the need to really create culturally sensitive awareness campaigns in the community and visiting families in person to kind of help build that trust. The program really has uh, worked and, and to bring in many women workers into their supply chain, of course, for the company itself, it's also helped to develop and strengthen their pipeline for talent. Um, in particular because the company wants to do more business in Bangladesh and its strengthened relationship with one of its key suppliers. So we know, you know, in that direct kind of um, engagement within its supply chain, that's an example of where the company has had impact and, and an influence. More indirectly, what we've done at BSR, we've done with many companies, is to take a look at things that are not necessarily within a company's direct ability to influence. Nevertheless, those issues have a real impact on their business. Um, so taking, for instance, the topic of gender-based violence, we have a working group of companies that are really digging into that issue. And, and while there are definitely things that they could do within their own workplaces, and we're working very closely to develop the kinds of tools and systems and policies and, and metrics that they need to influence that issue within their own workplaces, this is a situation that very much is tied to you know, gender stereotypes and cultural norms that very much are outside of a company's level of influence. So we look for opportunities for companies to engage in public policy, to make their voices heard from advocacy and other ways, to engage in a topic where they, again, know that it's having a business business impact, but they don't necessarily have the direct ability to influence the outcome of those issues. So I think really for companies, it's important to think about both their direct opportunities to have an influence as well as areas where they can have more of an indirect impact as well. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. That's, that's great. Um, Katie, I'll, I'll turn over to you. Um, you, of course, we, we heard about <clears throat> the products and services, uh, the, the AfriPad that you've developed. Um, and affordability of these products and accessibility of these products is, is obviously key to its success. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you went uh, about your pricing strategy and also how you are um, thinking about your, your scaling strategy? I know that through your partners you're able to get your products to other places, but in the retail side of things, have you thought about scaling to other countries as well? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, so I should start by saying the affordability of, of our product is really in the simplicity of its design. Uh, the reusable design um, enables girls and women to use it, use, use one to four pads for at least a year, often more. Um, and the sort of basic but high quality fabrics we use allow us to produce the product for a relatively low cost. We also invest quite a bit in R&D to make sure that we are um, using uh, our sort of manufacturing facilities as efficiently as possible. For a little bit of comparison, um, the year's supply of after pads, which is really four pads, is all one of these, costs $4.65, um, whereas a year's supply of disposable pads in a country like Uganda costs around $15. Um, where a reusable pad on the Western market, one reusable pad costs between $12 to $15, where we're able to sell, obviously, four pads for less than $5. So the simplicity of our design and the efficiencies that we, we use in our manufacturing facilities really enable us to provide uh, an affordable product. Um, in addition to that, um, our two brand model is really sort of the sweet spot. Um, we're able to use different pricing strategies for the Afropads and Socher brand um, because we sell to well, relief organizations and NGOs um, we're able to sell the Afropads brand at a higher margin that allows us to provide a little bit more of a subsidized margin uh, for, for the Socher brand that we sell in retail. Um, this allows us to, um, you know, allow women and girls who are buying this off the shelves in Uganda to buy it at a very cheap cost. Um, we also sell four packs of Afropods, but only two packs of Socher because our market, market research showed that the, the price tipping point for um, girls who would be buying this product in Uganda with around two pads. Um, obviously, the marketing strategies for both brands are really, really different. At Afropads, we work with NGOs and really agencies that are sort of using this as part of their core programming. We're so sure we really have had to figure out what women and girls want to see in a product. 
Um, and we created a brand new brand because we found that most women and girls in Uganda knew Acapad as a product for the poor, and they didn't want to buy it off the shelves. So we created SoSure, which is essentially the same product, different packaging, um, but it's created more as a, as a lifestyle brand, um, an aspirational brand that women and girls in Uganda want to have because they feel like it's a healthy, progressive alternative choice that's also durable and affordable for them. Um, and so sure, um, and our retail brand is really the core part of our scaling strategy. Um, there's huge market, obviously, for NGOs and relief agencies who are now seeing menstrual hygiene management as a core human right and a core part of their programming. Um, but we see a lot of um, NGOs and relief agencies looking to more cash-based alternatives. So, for example, um, some refugee camps, instead of giving out products, are giving out stipends to families who then can go choose what they spend their money on. Um, which, um, as sort of our core, our, our core market for the Acropads brand would be a huge hit to us. Um, so by developing the retail brand for so sure, we're hoping that as those trends start to shift in our core Acropads market, we'll have so sure that can jump in and provide the retail presence that we might need. Um, but in general, there's just huge things for this type of product, especially across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we have big plans to scale up across the region. We're actually launching SoShare in Kenya in April um, and have just launched it down in Malawi. So we have a retail brand in two countries in Eastern Africa and one country in Southern Africa and have plans to scale it to quite a few more countries in the coming five years because we see huge opportunity and huge growth uh, for the retail brand. Um, as well as still a huge need in the market for the Africa's brand. Thank you, Katie. This is um, great news. Um, we are starting to receive questions. We have 10 more minutes for questions from the audience. Um, the first one is a question for Aditi. Uh, what do you feel is or should be the role of the public sector or even donors in fostering uh, women's economic empowerment integration in business? Yeah, it's a good question, and there there definitely is, you know, many different elements of, of what the role of the public sector could be. Of course, they create ultimately the enabling environment of the legal and structural frameworks which truly allow women to pursue the economic opportunities and for business to be able to then, you know, harness those economic opportunities. It also, the public sector, of course, has a, a big ability to direct resources towards women in their own procurement and in their own employment practices, which shouldn't be, of course, overlooked. And then, um, in particular, with their lending and, and development work, they can integrate a gender lens into that. And we've seen increasingly a number of countries taking a kind of feminist development policy type approach. Um, I think, you know, where, where they can have the biggest influence, of course, in vis-a-vis -vis the private sector is really in that first bucket around the enabling environment and the kind of legal and structure, structural barriers that they may put up uh, to prevent women from fully participating in, in the economy, and in particular looking at you know, where women are most vulnerable um, in informal employment practices, for example, and then looking at you know, industries or sectors where women are really underrepresented and how they can encourage or direct resources such that women would be able to participate in those sectors in, um, in a more meaningful way are probably some of the most important uh, tools that they have. They definitely have a role, but you know, all of that to say is that you know, the private sector has the opportunity uh, to move quicker and, um, and direct resources and engage in this space without necessarily always the leadership from the public sector. And so while um, they can definitely have an, in, they have a huge influence and a huge ability to create change, we definitely encourage you know, businesses to look at what they can do within their own um, sphere of influence to, to move in that direction. Great, thank you Aditi. We also have another question, which uh, I think Aditi, you, you, you touched on on the example that you gave on the Swedish company and the supply chain work, so I'll direct it to Anne. Um, how do we encourage more women entrepreneurs in low-income countries to enter the formal economy so, they, so that they can become a part of larger company supply chains? Anna, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. Yes. 
thank you so much. Um, this is a very good question. And I think the, the definition of informal economy means that they haven't uh, necessarily registered their businesses. Um, and that would be the first step um, to actually have the, the company or the enterprise uh, formally established and registered uh, in the system. Uh, we know that there's an increasing um, interest and awareness around uh, empowering women in the supply chain. And, and just also touching upon the previous question, what the public sector can do. And we can see, for example, the, the government of Kenya has taken a leadership role in showing that it's actually possible to source uh, and have a quota um, of 30% to source from women, uh, youth, and, and uh, disabled people. Um, and to have really taking on that leadership role. Um, and I think um, as a result, there has been an increasing number of companies. Uh, we are working with a few of those that have made major commitments to source their goods and services from uh, women-owned business. But to be considered a, a woman-owned business, you need to first have registered. And there is also an increasing uh, number of uh, efforts and initiatives to help these um, women-owned businesses to actually be uh, certified as such. Um, so I think that is, is the, the really the starting point and work both with women entrepreneurs to understand that, um, that they need to be registered and potentially also certified, uh, but also to work with companies to understand how they can uh, better source from, from women entrepreneurs and women-owned business. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Anna. And Katie, I'll uh, direct this question to you so you can speak from the experience of Afropath, uh, which is around how can we, uh, it's, it's similar, but it's really understanding in countries where most women are concentrated in casual or low-skilled work and they're earning you know, much less than men, how do you uh, go about dealing with these issues and provide meaningful employment to them? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's important to, um, you know, one, decrease the barrier of entry for women into the formal economy, um, to providing women with jobs where they can get on the job training without having to, you know, apply to a job or enter the workforce with training that they probably wouldn't have any opportunity to get beforehand. Um, and after is something we really prioritize. Um, we hire women who maybe have some basic tailoring skills um, or maybe none at all, but then provide real life on the job training that allows them to have a job in the formal workforce, but then after they leave after pads, go find other jobs in the formal workforce that they wouldn't be able to do before. Um, so decreasing the barriers to entry, providing real life on the job training, um, and um, obviously, making sort of social decisions about where companies um, and businesses decide to hire them um, is another way that, you know, many women who are living in, in capital cities probably have more money and more ability to participate in the formal workforce, but companies that are sourcing their employees from more rural areas that obviously have more low-income resources um, is another way that you can bring women who wouldn't have the opportunity beforehand into the formal workforce, provide training and opportunities so they can continue to be active members of the formal economy in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. We are actually running out of time. I think we've heard um, great messages from all of our speakers. Uh, you know, it's all around thinking holistically, integrated throughout the value chain, uh, making sure that, of course, it makes sense for the company and it's uh, within the strategy and the priorities and where you can make the most difference. Um, um, you know, I, th I thought it was important what Anna mentioned around the importance of the high-level um, support and ownership, uh, the C-suite level, but also to deal with uh, middle-level management as well. Um, it was music to our ears uh, to hear about the importance of measurement, as this is one of the areas that Business Call to Action is placing a lot of importance as well. And of course, seeing uh, a, a successful example in Afropath is, I think, very inspiring and encouraging for all of us. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the kind of discussions that 
we really uh, hope to have more of, and we think it, um, you know, strengthen, strengthens our community of inclusive business practitioners and, and companies, and um, what really helps us build a more inclusive economy as well. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, we are recording this webinar, so you will receive a link to the presentation uh, and the slides that we use today, but also to the audio recording. And as a reminder, uh, as you'll see on, on the screen, um, uh, register for our next web webinar if you haven't yet. Uh, it's going to focus mostly on navigating the enablers and the constraints. Uh, and we look, of course, uh, forward to your engagement on that as well. Thank you, Aditi, Anna, and Katie. Uh, really, it was very inspiring to hear your uh, thoughts and your work. Uh, and thank you all for joining our webinar as well. Have a good day. Thank you so much.